Welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, we are so glad to have you with us as we worship the Lord together today. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4. It says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day by day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched his tent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day, and it is our privilege to come and to honor you today. Lord, uh, the heavens declare your glory, but that's, that's not all. Your creation in, underneath those heavens declare your glory as well. And Lord, that is our desire today, that in this building and throughout this world, we would declare your glory. We would do, give praise to who you are today. Lord, you are the one who holds us together. The very breath we breathe is a gift that is given from you to us. So Lord, I pray that we would use the breath that we have to honor and glorify you today. Lord, uh, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who offered himself as a sacrifice for us to give us freedom not from tyranny or not from, from foreign enemies, but Lord, you gave us the ultimate freedom, freedom from hell, freedom from the penalty that our sin should give us. You offered us what we do not deserve, everlasting life, the right to become children of God. So Lord, we thank you and we give praise to your son, Jesus Christ, and we worship him today. So Lord, as we worship through song, through prayer, through opening up your word and applying its truths to our lives, Lord, I pray that you would be praised. Lord, we pray for those who are unable to be here today, those who are struggling with cancer, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are mourning the loss of ones they love, those who are struggling emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and we know that there are many in our world. Lord, I pray that you would meet them, meet them in our body of believers, meet them in our community, and meet them in the world. And Lord, use us to encourage them, to build them up, and to draw them towards Christ. Lord, it's our desire today, it's our hope today, that you would be first and foremost in our worship. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, I have a uh, number of announcements to share with you, so let me jump right into it. Uh, Youth Night returns tonight. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been off for a couple weeks. Uh, we are returning tonight at 5.30, uh, but instead of being back at the pavilion, we're going to be over at Cape Christian Academy starting at 5.30. Uh, so uh, that is... Uh, uh, that's going to be starting up tonight. Uh, with other activities that are going on uh, this week, uh, Iron Men are going to be meeting Monday at 7 o'clock. Uh, invite you to uh, join us for that if you're able. Prayer meeting uh, is meeting here at the church at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. Uh, also, if you're not able to make it to prayer meeting, uh, we have been continuing to uh, email out the prayer list, and we will continue to do so. Also, on top of that, um, uh, we, uh, we're going to... Uh, we have the prayer list here, so you're welcome to take them. We want to just uh, get that information out to you. We want as many people praying uh, for our church and for our community and the people in it uh, as possible. Uh, I do want to let you know that our, our Thursday evening uh, evangelism class, we had our last class this past Thursday, uh, so that we're going to be taking a break from our Thursday evening classes probably until uh, the beginning of January. Uh, but uh, we had, uh, we had an inc uh, incredible study uh, thank you for all those who come out, and um, we, between learning different ways to present the gospel, uh, this week we spent time working on writing and sharing our personal testimony. Uh, it was uh, an incredible study. As far as our Extra Mile classes go, uh, we're actually going to be on break from Extra Mile for the next two weeks. Uh, obviously, our Thursday class is done for a little while, but uh, Sunday after service, we're not going to be meeting uh, this week or next week. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing uh, some uh, letter writing and sending some cards to uh, our shut-ins and other people uh, in our community. So I invite you to join us after service next week. We're going to be working on this. 
This week, uh, right after the service is over, as many of you guys saw as you came through uh, the, the Narthex, uh, we're going to be doing our Operation Christmas Child Packing Party. And I think we have one, one last video uh, to share with you guys, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The countdown happens, and the cheers just erupt everywhere. They jump up with the joy. They jump up with smiles. <laughs> They've just now got their boxes. They're opening them. And the fun is watching the children. This could be the first present that they've ever received. These children just received the shoe boxes. You can see how excited they are. <laughs> Operation Christmas Child Gifts really touches children's heart. This shoe box is a demonstration of the love of God. During distribution, we tell children that there is a God who created us and who loved us. Jesus loves you. Ah, good. <laughs> Volunteers from all walks of life and all ages love packing Operation Christmas Child Shoebox gifts. What an amazing moment and opportunity to show people, to really show people the love of God. Samaritan's Purse would not be able to do Operation Christmas Child without this army of volunteers. They're like angels. It's just a special opportunity to reach people with the love of Christ. By the way, I'm so grateful for these boxes and what they represent. Lives are being changed and souls are being saved and the Lord is receiving the glory. So to God, I'm, I'm about to cry, please. Once you pack the shoebox, from there they'll be sent all around the world. And that is only the beginning. After children receive gifts, we welcome them to the Greatest Journey 12 Lesson Discipleship Program. The program introduces them to Jesus Christ and teaches them stories from the Bible. It sets a good Christian foundation for them and sends them on a brand new journey of life. Isn't it incredible to see the impact these simple gifts are making in the lives of children all over the world? Millions of boys and girls are hearing and responding in faith and then taking the gospel truly to the ends of the earth. A lot of these children, their life is absolutely transformed. Jesus said, let them come to me. And we're in the middle of bringing the children to Jesus. What amazes me the most is the miracles in each box. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your continued support. Many children around the world still need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We always need more shoe boxes. So keep packing. Thank you. And God bless. Well, as I mentioned, uh, right after the service today, uh, we're going to do our part. Uh, we have uh, tables that are set up and ready to go. Um, and we are uh, going to spend some time packing, uh, packing those boxes. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Leanne and uh, Marion, who unfortunately isn't able to be here. She's recovering from surgery uh, for the many, many hours that they've put in. Uh, we're going we're gonna to pack a whole bunch of shoe boxes. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. You spend hours putting the meal together, and they eat it in like 15 minutes, right? <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of hours and a lot of preparation, uh, a lot of time that, that goes into getting those boxes out. So uh, when you get a moment, uh, uh, thank Leanne. And uh, if you have a moment, uh, give a call or send a letter to Marion. Uh, I'm sad that she can't be here today to, uh, to see this because this is a, a year-round job that they, uh, they do uh, preparing for this uh, uh, this one afternoon. So I uh, invite you guys to stay. Uh, we'll have a wonderful time putting these boxes together, praying over them, and sending them out. And uh, with them, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ uh, goes goes with it. A couple other really brief uh, informational things. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, 
Anyway, uh, the Iron Men uh, are going to are planning to uh, put together and deliver uh, Thanksgiving meals again uh, the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, this time, a as you guys know, we have been meeting uh, with other churches at the end of uh, at the end of each month. We actually invited them to join us. Uh, so on Monday night, uh, November the twenty second, we were we were going to be hosting uh, a community uh, Iron Men here at the church, uh, but instead we're going to have a uh, community meal, uh, meal putting together party. I don't, I don't know, I don't have a clever name for that, sorry. Uh, but we're going to, uh, we have men from uh, a number of different churches, we're going to put together meals, uh, obviously we're going to deliver some, hopefully we'll be able to put enough meals together to give to some of those other churches so they can take, uh, they can take it to their shut-ins and the contacts that they have in the community, uh, and our hope is, I know other meals we've We've been able to distribute uh, upwards of 100 meals. Uh, we're, we're hoping to be able to maybe even double that uh, and to send the love of Jesus out, not just, uh, not just in the name of First Baptist, but ultimately in the name of Jesus Christ uh, and to reach many people uh, with the love of that. That being said, I know uh, Iron Men is usually a men's ministry, uh, but on November 22nd, if you are interested in helping, uh, it's, we're going to have many hands, and many hands make light work. Uh, so if you would like to join us, uh, that's uh, Monday night, uh, uh, November the 22nd. We're planning to start at 630. Um, so if you would like to come and help us uh, make meals, put them together, um, or if you're interested in delivering those meals a little bit later in the week, uh, please uh, please grab one of us uh, Iron Men. Uh, we would uh, love to have you uh, be a part of that. Uh, if you're interested in... Um, Helping out with with the with the food, uh, we're I believe we're going to do stuffing and mashed potatoes um, and, and turkeys. I think we have the turkeys in place, or we, we should be able to get those. But if you'd like to donate stuffing, mashed potatoes, vegetables, anything like that, um, that would be that would be wonderful. We'd be glad to have it. Uh, that's coming up uh, at the beginning of next week. Also want to remind you, because we are just a week or two away from Thanksgiving, we're going to have a Thanksgiving Eve service here at the church on Wednesday night, November the 24th. That's going to start at 7 p.m. We're going to have a wonderful time of worship, uh, just a wonderful time of counting our blessings. Um, sometimes in the midst of all the craziness that's going on in our world, uh, sometimes we can lose track of just how blessed we are. Um, and, and the amazing thing is we are incredibly blessed, even in the midst of all those things. Um, so I want to invite you to come and join us uh, on the 24th as we, uh, as we thank the Lord together for the blessings that we have. One last thing, uh, speaking of blessings, um, special thanks to the Radzettas um, who uh, have uh, refinished our parking lot. They uh, filled in some holes there and uh, uh, did a top coating for us. Uh, I just wanted to, to thank them. I, I, I went over and thanked John personally, um, and uh, it, just an incredibly, uh, incredibly generous and, and kind thing to do. Uh, we're, they're good neighbors. <laughs> so uh, if you happen to see John in passing or any member of the Radzetta family, uh, give them our thanks because uh, it looks very nice out there. All right, with all, with all that being said, I'm going to ask Faye to come up now, and uh, we have some praise and worship. Both of those songs remind us um, just how blessed we are. We have a God who doesn't just take care of our physical needs, um, and he certainly does that oftentimes in abundance. But he also takes care of our greater needs, our spiritual needs. He is mighty to save us. We may try and endeavor to save ourselves, but the reality is we fall woefully short. And in light of everything that God has done for us, this is, this is how the attitude that we come to our time of tithe and offerings, realizing that we give because we have a God who has given abundantly to us over and over again. So let me pray. And We'll take the offering at this time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. You have taken care of every need that we could have, physically and spiritually. You have provided a place for us in eternity with you. And if that were not enough, you have taken care of us here as we wait until we are called to heaven. So, Lord, as we give, uh, we are reminded of how much you have given us, how generous, how thoughtful you have been. So, Lord, we pray that you would take these tithes and offerings and you would continue to use them to further your kingdom in this world. That every man, woman, and child would have the opportunity to hear of the good news of Jesus Christ and be able to follow you. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name.
Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. Ooh. Sorry. Too busy making jokes, not enough time turning my microphone on. That's right. I'm trying to be a yuckster up here. Anyway, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13, starting with verse uh, 13 today. But before we uh, get back into the book of Acts, as a pastor, um, one of my primary jobs is to come up with all the jokes for the week. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, one, of my, <laughs> one of my primary jobs uh, is, is preparing and delivering a sermon each and every week. Some of you may be saying, well, Pastor, maybe you need to put in a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> but the, the reality is many hours of my week uh, go into preparation and prayer and, and study into God's Word and then figuring out how to present all that stuff to you guys in a way that is interesting and doesn't make you fall asleep. Um, but the reality is, as much time and preparation and prayer as you put into a sermon, sometimes they don't always go exactly uh, the way you would, you would want them to. In fact, many pastors have shared uh, some parts of their sermon that have gone awry. Tom shares this. He says, I was serving as a missionary in Mexico, and I had a pretty good grasp on the language, but I still struggled with various words. I was in a series of messages on how great God is and was expressing the love of God for his children. I meant to say he knows how many hairs we have on our heads. But instead, I said he even knows how many horses are on our heads. <laughs> when I said this, I saw the older people have questioning faces, and the younger people started laughing. The word horse and hair are quite close in Spanish, and I obviously chose the wrong word. I stopped the preaching and turned to a teenager in the church who was bilingual and asked her what I had said. She told me that I said that God knows the, how many horses are on my head. I was a little embarrassed, but I tried to save it by saying, well, you know what? God knows how many horses are on your head, too. <laughs> Bo, uh, Bo shares this story. I was invited to speak to a bunch of high schoolers at a popular Christian high school in Memphis. While I was preaching, I saw some girls in the front row who kept giggling nervously. I couldn't figure out why they kept laughing. Even when I got to the serious parts of my message, they were still laughing. When it was done, I walked off stage and I immediately knew. I could feel some breeziness. <laughs> I realized that I had to preach the entire sermon with my fly down. <laughs> Sadly, one of the girls walked up to me and said, just thought I'd let you know, sir, your fly is down. <laughs> <laughs> David shares this. As a pastor, I was giving the... I was giving, giving the welcome and announcements to begin our service. It was Palm Sunday, 
So I was briefly sharing how Jesus rode, on to, rode into town on a donkey, to which I inquired of the audience if anyone had come to church on a donkey. A reply came from a woman in the audience. She pointed to her husband and said, No, but I came with one. <laughs> Well, the reality is sermons don't always go the way we imagine and even practice that they would, but they appear often in both the Old and New Testament as one of the primary ways that God shares truth with his people. Here in Acts chapter 13, we're going to see the first of several sermons that Paul preaches in the book of Acts. And Paul uses the spoken word to lead many to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, for, if you haven't joined us for a while, we've been working our way through the book of Acts. Uh, the, first, uh, the first dozen chapters or so focus on the ministry of the church in Jerusalem and how they spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the city of Jerusalem and to the area of Judea and Samaria. But in Acts chapter 10, the followers of Jesus Christ came to a startling revelation that the good news of Jesus Christ wasn't just for Jews, but God had intended for all people to hear and put their faith in Jesus Christ. So the church began to expand, including into the area of Antioch, where the, the majoritively Gentile city of Antioch came and accepted the Lord, and we see the church in Antioch begin to grow, a mostly Gentile church. And out of that church, the, the, the Antioch church had a heart for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with both Jews and Gentiles throughout the rest of the world. So they send Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey. And that's kind of where we're at here in Acts chapter 13. The story of Acts moves away from the church in Jerusalem and even from the church in Antioch. And it focuses on the travels of Paul and Barnabas as they begin to keep following God's commands to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the very ends of the earth. Last week, we looked at the first leg of Paul and Barnabas' journey as they shared the gospel on the island of Cyprus. And they had really great success, but they also faced strong opposition. Their journey continues here in Acts chapter 13. And we're going to look at, look at this today, uh, verses 13 to 32. This is going to be a pretty long section that I'm going to read for you guys. But we're going to, we're going to break down as Paul, uh, we have the first recorded sermon of Paul uh, to the people of uh, Poseidon Antioch. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 13 to 52. Here's what God's word says. From, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went to Poseidon Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hands and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. And for about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations of, in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus. As he promised, before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem 
and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to, give, to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, and they are now his witness to our people. We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors. He has fulfilled for us their children by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I, give you the ho I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you are not able to under, uh, obtain under the law of Moses. Take care of what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers. Wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would have never believed, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what was, Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. All right, let's pray and we'll tackle these verses together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to study your word. The Bible tells us that all your word is profitable for teaching, for knowledge, for rebuking and understanding. So Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us as we tackle this pretty heavy passage and to give us wisdom to what it's saying. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that was a pretty long passage, but honestly, I couldn't find a good place to, to break it into two pieces. Uh, so, so we're going to tackle the whole thing. And the reality is that most of this narrative um, centers around Paul's message to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles that are living in Poseidon, Antioch. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the first of several so sermons that Paul preaches in the book of Acts. Uh, but what's interesting about these sermons by Paul, um, I, I, I remember a time, um, my, my kids remember this well, there was, there was a period of time where I wasn't a full-time pastor, and uh, I was often invited to preach at different churches. Um, and my, my kids remember this time because they would always say, well, Dad, you just preach the same sermon at all, all these different, uh, different churches. I was like, yeah, well, like, it's a brand new audience. They, like, this is all new stuff to them. Uh, so they're like, I, and I felt bad every once in a while I'd throw in something different just for them because they had to sit there and listen to me over and over again. Uh, but the reality is, what's interesting about Paul is Acts records a couple of different sermons by Paul, but each one of those sermons is very unique. 
Why? Well, to understand why, we need to learn a little bit about what Poseidon Antioch was like. Uh, let me, I, I think we have a map of Poseidon Antioch. That, so after, uh, after they leave Cyprus, last week they were on the island of Cyprus, and we saw that they went, in, they went entirely through the, uh, the island of Cyprus to they got to the capital city of Paphos, which is on the western side. And then after they left Paphos, they, they sailed north. Now this was about a 200-mile uh, boat ride up into Asia Minor because uh, it tells us that they arrived in Perga, um, which, uh, uh, which is in Asia Minor. Now, we mentioned last week Cyprus was the home of Barnabas. This is where he grew up, and he was very familiar with Cyprus, so it made, a, made it a very natural place for them to start their missionary journey. Uh, does anybody know where, where Paul is from? Well, he, he spent time in Jerusalem, but he's actually a native of Tarsus, which is, uh, which is in Asia Minor. So now we're moving up into an into area that Paul is very familiar with. So it says they arrived in Perga, and, and then uh, they made their way to uh, north to, Persi- to Poseidon, Antioch. Um, it was about a, what's that? I'm saying it wrong, Poseidon, Poseidon. I've heard it both ways. <laughs> Uh, what's in Asia Minor? Uh, they, uh, they made a grueling 100-mile hike uh, from the port of Purga to Pisidian. All right, fine, we'll go with Pisidian. Pisidian Antioch. Um, now, Pisidian Antioch was located uh, uh, 36,000, not 36, 3,600 feet above sea level in the Taurus Mountains. In other words, they... Once they landed on there, they took a 100-mile hike pretty much straight up uh, to, uh, to get to Pisidian, Antioch. Uh, the, the journey also included multiple river crossings, uh, and that area was also infamous for its band of robbers. Um, in fact, Paul might have been referencing this particular part of his missionary journey in 2 Corinthians 11.26. Look what he says here. Uh, it says, I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. i got to imagine Paul is kind of remembering this part of the journey in the first part of that verse. And once he's in uh, Pisidian Antioch, Paul and Barnabas visit the Jewish synagogue on the first Sabbath that they're in the town. Now, this was both Paul and Barnabas' tradition to go and to find the Jews in that area. Um, And what we see, uh, and Paul mentions this twice in this passage, is not only was the synagogue filled with Jews, but many God-fearing Greeks. These were were Greeks, not not, uh, Hebronic Jews, who had put their faith in the Old Testament. And it was not long after he came to the synagogue that Paul found himself preaching to the Jews of the city. So let's look, at, let's look at Paul's preaching. Let me ask you a question before we look at this. Have you ever wondered why most of our church services center around preaching? I mean, we, we show up to church week after week, and normally you get there, and you come to expect that somebody is going to get up there and talk for a really long time. Have you ever really given it thought, why, we, why do we do this? <laughs> what do you think, Tom? Why do we do this? Yeah, it, it's it, it's not just the history of the church. Well, we got to give we got to give Pastor something, Pastor George something to do during his week. So let's make him talk a lot about the Bible. But the reality is, not only is it the history of the church, it's also the command of God. It it, it is something that that God has given us directive to do. A deacon once asked one of Mor- uh, Campbell Morgan's grandsons, Campbell Morgan, if you're not familiar, is a very famous preacher, but he asked one of his grandsons if he intended to become a preacher like his grandfather, his father, and his four uncles. The young man looked at the deacon and he said, No, sir, I'm going to go get a real job. <laughs> The simple answer to why preaching is central to our worship is that it is the command of God. It is because the proclamation of God's word is something that God himself 
has asked of his people. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, we read this. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Ideally, preaching is not about the vanity of the preacher. It's not my job to get up here and tell you and show you how much I know and understand about the Bible. It is the command of God. We are called to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So to be honest with you, if I'm not here, you know what should happen? One of y'all should get up here and start preaching. Why? Because that's what we're called to do as believers in Jesus Christ. We are called to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. You said, well, I, you know, I haven't been trained in hermeneutics. I haven't, whatever. Get up here and read and, and call out the good news of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul says this to his friend Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. We don't do this haphazardly. We don't do this because this is the tradition of the church. We do this because it's the command and call of God. It is our job to build each other up in the word of God and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to anyone who has not heard it. The truth is that both throughout the Old and the New Testament, every time that the word of God is moved forward, it has been on the back of preaching. When the, when the people of Israel had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they were finally ready to go into the, into the promised land. The last book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, is literally a series of sermons from Moses, who's about to die, and hand leadership over to Joshua to the Israelites. If you open up Deuteronomy, it's just sermon after sermon after sermon. What is he doing? He's preparing the people of Israel to go do what God had commanded them to do. The prophets, when you read the prophets, the prophets are really just books of sermons. Yes, do they occasionally give some insight into the coming Messiah or what's going to happen next? Yeah, absolutely. But the vast majority of what you read in the prophetic books are Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel proclaiming and preaching the word to God's often wayward people. Did Jesus preach? Absolutely. Jesus took every opportunity to preach, whether it was on a mountain or in a boat or standing in the middle of the temple. Jesus preached often. When the Holy Spirit comes, what does Peter do? Holy Spirit is coming, and what does he do? He preaches, right? <laughs> Acts, Acts chapter 2 and 3 are, ser are is a sermon by Peter. Philip goes to the Samaritans. What does he do? He preaches. He preaches to them. And now here Paul goes out, and what does he do? He enters the synagogue. And he, began, he begins to preach. Even if you look through church history, every time we have revival, both in this country and throughout the world, it has been sparked by Bible-centered preaching. So in light of that, now that we understand that I'm not just up here because we got to kill a half hour, <laughs> let's look at Paul's message to the Jews here in Poseidon Antioch. I forgot what it's called now. <laughs> Let's look at Paul's message. Uh, what, what's interesting is while, while in the book of Acts, we have a couple of different messages from Paul that we're going to look at. While, while Paul's messages are not all the same, there are a couple of things that Paul consistently does in every one of his messages. Let's look at those first. The first thing he does in every one of his messages is that he finds common ground. Uh, as a preacher, and I'll say this for me personally, as a preacher, it's pretty important for me to be able to connect uh, to the people that I'm speaking to. If I don't connect with you at some point during the sermon, what do you do? Yeah, you find something else, don't you? You're, you, know, you start flipping through your Bible, reading random verses. You start thinking about what you got to do after church is over. Some of you might even doze off, right? If I don't find a way to connect with you somehow and get you to listen, you're going to be like Angie over... No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, Angie. <laughs> She's like, what? What were you talking about? No, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> a man went to see his doctor for advice about uh, being cured of his snoring. The doctor asked, uh, does your snoring disturb your wife? The patient replied, does it disturb my wife? Man, it disturbs the entire congregation. <laughs> yeah, that's generally not the sound you want to hear. And if you're starting to hear that sound, we got a connection problem. And Paul was aware of that because what does he immediately do when he enters the synagogue? He finds connection with his audience. Paul is of what ethnicity? He's, he's Jewish, right? And he is an expert in the law. Remember, before he was a follower of Jesus Christ, he was a Pharisee. So as a result, in, in Jewish synagogues, when you had a traveling rabbi who came, into your, uh, to, came into your synagogue, it was tradition to give that rabbi an opportunity to speak. So what is, Paul gets invited to come and speak during synagogue. Does Paul pass on the opportunity? No, absolutely not. Paul never passes on an opportunity. You're going to see that as we go through the book of Acts. So Paul is a Jew, and what's Paul, who's Paul's audience? Yeah, they are majoritively Jewish. Now, we, we do find that in these passages, there are God-fearing Greeks as well, but the vast majority of people that are in the synagogue are Jewish, which means what do they believe in? They believe in the Old Testament, don't they? Paul is an expert in the Old Testament, and his audience is are believers in the Old Testament. So what do you think Paul does? Yeah, he, he immediately recognizes that he has something in common with his audience. So where does this sermon begin? He begins giving them a detailed explanation of how God had been working through the Jews in the Old Testament. Why? Because both he and his audience honor and believe in the Old Testament. So as a result, from verses 17 to 22, Paul builds on this common ground as he explains to the people the rich history of the Jews and how God has been working truth and working his way to the Messiah through it. So after Paul builds common ground with his audience, what does he do next? Well, he connects Jesus to the common ground. After, after finding the, the common ground of truth in the Old Testament, Paul begins to show his listeners that the Old Testament has been pointing to Jesus this entire time. With this group, he focuses specifically on the connection between King David and the coming Messiah. Paul explains that the beloved King David was a picture of the promised Messiah that was to come. And this is pretty easy to show from the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel 17, verses 12 and 13, we read this. God says this to David. He says, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to, to secede you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who I will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Forever. God had made a promise to David that there was always going to be a king from his line that would reign for eternity. Well, how can a human or even the, the family of a human like David reign for eternity? Well, the king of kings had to come from the line of David, which is why the Bible goes through so much effort to show us that Jesus Christ comes from the line of David. Because this is a promise that God had made in the Old Testament. Remember, both his audience and he believe in the Old Testament. He says, you know that this promise exists in the Old Testament, that God has promised that there will be an eternal king from the Davidic line. That eternal king is here, and his name is Jesus. But unlike David, whose life and kingdom only lasted a limited time, the Bible tells us that Jesus' kingdom will never end. Where is Jesus right now? He's seated at the right hand of God. For how long? Forever. Why? Because it is finished. The work is done. The reign has begun. And when does it end? It never ends. Because no one can take Jesus Christ off the throne. See, using the Old Testament, 
Paul connected his listeners to God's promise of the Messiah. He does this passage after passage throughout a sermon. So Paul has, Paul has created common ground. He's used that common ground to connect them to Jesus. What does he do next? Well, finally, he shares the importance of Jesus. Paul does a wonderful job here of connecting everything and tying what they already believed into how Jesus fit into it. It would be a real shame to do all that work and never get to the point of them believing, right? Because, listen, if they just had a knowledge that Jesus Christ was the, the, the Messiah, the, the Son of David, would that save them? No, not really. What did they need to do? They needed to believe. They needed to understand why they needed a Messiah. They needed to understand why they needed a Savior. So, listen, Paul does a great job of connecting everybody. Everybody's listening. Everybody's paying attention. But now he drives home the point. Well, what does he say? Well, let's look at verses 38 and 39 one more time. Back here. He says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. He's made the connection with them. He's connected Jesus to the things that they believe. He says, listen... It's great that you know these things, but you have to believe them. Paul shares with his listeners that Jesus did what the Old Covenant, remember these are Jewish people who are living the Old Testament Judaism. He says Jesus did what the Old Covenant could not. It brings genuine forgiveness of sins. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 we read this. The law, the Old Testament law, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. So Paul stands in front of these Jews. He says, listen, you are still following the Mosaic Covenant. Here's the problem with the Mosaic Covenant is you go back year after year and you make sacrifice after sacrifice. Why do you have to keep going back? Because those sacrifices run out. They only cover for so long. And then you have to go back year after year. And he's like, listen, there is a better promise that's here. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died once and for all, for all people. Jesus doesn't have to keep going back to the cross every year to cover our sins, does he? No, he goes to the cross, he says, it is finished, and he is seated at the right hand of God. Why? Because the job is done. He says, listen, you guys are living under the wrong covenant. The Messiah is here. The new covenant is here. Put your faith and trust in Him. We needed something more to be truly forgiven from our sins. What did we get? We got Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 8, 6, we read this. But in fact, the ministry of Jesus, the ministry Jesus has received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which He is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Listen, we don't want to go back to the old way. Why? Because the old way was inferior. Sacrificing bulls and goats didn't forgive our sins. It covered over our sins. But Jesus sent his one and only son as the perfect sacrifice once and for all for all people. And whoever calls upon Jesus Christ, both Jew or Gentile, can have everlasting life. This was Paul's message in the synagogue on this Saturday. 
He came and shared with them. He connected with them. He tied Jesus into them. And then he explained what exactly Jesus did for them so that they can have everlasting life. Jesus did the exact same things for us as well. The Bible tells us that every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you've been coming to church since you were old enough to remember. Maybe you've sat in, a, sat in a chair or sat in a pew your entire life. Guess what? Coming to church doesn't save you. Having parents that are followers of Jesus doesn't save you. Because the Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible goes on to tell us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. We all sin and the penalty for everyone's sin is the same. Not just physical death, but eternal separation from God. But while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The reality is, left to ourselves, every single one of us would be left out of God's kingdom. But God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to pay for the sins that we cannot pay for ourselves and give us everlasting life. Well, if Jesus Christ did this, shouldn't everyone be in heaven? Well, the Bible tells us that it is a gift. And like any gift we receive, whether it's on our birthday, or whether it's on Christmas morning, or whatever, the gift doesn't become yours until you do what? Until you receive it. Until you take it for yourself. The same is true with God's gift of salvation. It is available to anyone. It's there under the tree, but you have to come and receive that gift yourself. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we would be saved. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Much like Paul preached the sermon for the point of people coming to know Jesus Christ, that same covenant, that same promise is available to us today. If you have never called on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do so today. Listen, everyone in this room Guess what? We're all in the exact same situation. Every one of us. Just Guess what? Because I'm an extra three feet up doesn't mean I'm any less sinful. I got the same sin that you have. I got the same weakness that you have. But I also have the same hope that's available to you. The gift of everlasting life through Jesus Christ. If you've never called on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to do so today. You don't need me to walk you through some special prayer, but I'd be glad to do it if you want. We simply call on the name of Jesus Christ. Confess him as Lord of our lives and believe in what he has done for us. And the Bible says we will be saved. This was the sermon that Paul preached that Saturday morning. It's the same sermon we preach today. We proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word and to consider what it means. I thank you for the blessing of proclaiming your word, proclaiming this unbelievable truth that is for all people at all times. It is what we sing about. It is what we praise you about. It is what we preach about. The fact that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but they can have everlasting life. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for giving us this gift of salvation. We do not deserve it and we cannot earn it. It is only given through your son, Jesus Christ. So if there's anyone here today who has heard these words and wants to turn their hearts to you, 
I pray that they would do so. We can find lots of reasons to put it off until tomorrow. But Lord, salvation is here today. And it is for all people who call on you. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name. Before I dismiss this in our benediction, just a reminder, uh, we are, will be uh, starting the packing party in just a few minutes uh, in the narthex, so I uh, invite you to uh, stay and uh, help us uh, uh, get these uh, boxes together and get them out to, uh, to people, and uh, the good news of Jesus Christ uh, will go with them. Our benediction comes from 2 Thessalonians, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes this, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed 